So good morning all, uh, welcome to Berkeley Lab. Welcome to the Deep Learning for Science Summer School. We're really glad to have you here. Uh, thanks for waking up bright and early on a, on a Monday morning. Um, so, uh, you know, I did want to acknowledge early on that uh, deep learning, of course, has been taking off over the past seven years. Um, and over the last five years, we've really seen deep learning for science take off. Um, the reason that, you know, we have 150 of you here, uh, pretty much the room is at capacity, is because we all feel there's a lot of promise in applying deep learning techniques to scientific problems. Um, you can read a lot of generic introductions to deep learning and machine learning on the web, but really there is no definitive resource where you can turn to for deep learning for science material. So this is really a brainchild of Mustafa. I think about a year ago, he felt that there was an, an, a need, a gap in the community to create a targeted event wherein we could really go into depth on uh, what would it take to get deep learning work for, for scientific applications. And that's the reason why this summer school exists. So today we're gonna kick things off with uh, Brenda Ng. So Brenda is, is a, uh, is, is the group lead for machine learning at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And uh, she's going to walk us through a, a basic introduction to machine learning. And we'll be diving into uh, an introduction to deep learning later on in the day. So Brenda, welcome. Good morning, everybody. So um, when Mustafa told me to do an intro to machine learning, um, it's kind of like a challenge because machine learning an intro to machine learning is kind of like a fashion show in that um, every one of us of different ages, when we were going through grad, graduate school, we would have different exposure to the algor algorithm du jour of machine learning. Um, and so as a result, I decided that because there's only 90 minutes um, in this lecture, I'm going to just focus on more of a deep learning perspective of machine learning. So I'm still going to cover um, most of the basics of machine learning. But once I get down to more of the models, I'm going to talk more about the specific deep learning models that can achieve some of the different types of learning that I'm gonna talk about. So um, I'm doing a lecture style type of presentation. So um, these are the learning objectives. Um, in particular, hopefully after the end of my talk, you guys will be able, you guys and ladies will be able to answer these questions like what is machine learning? What's the relationship between deep learning and machine learning and AI and all that good stuff? You guys can read. Okay, so where does the term machine learning even come from? So it actually came from 1959 when Samuel Arthur actually coined this term machine learning as the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. But that's kind of like, kind of, I mean, I'm sure he's a great guy, but it's kind of wishy-washy and not too concrete. And so come 1998, um, Tom Mitchell, um, another American ML researcher, decided to put more oomph into the definition by posing it as a well-posed learning problem. And he said, um, machine learning ought to be defined as a computer program that can learn from experience with respect to some task and some performance measure, um, yeah, and so that it can improve with experience. And so with these definitions, um, again, look at these dates, they're still kind of like in the early days of deep learning, um, but already these definitions kind of firm up what researchers like yourself are going to um, kind of research and perhaps aim your, um, aim your curiosity towards. And so, let me get into the relationship between AI, ML, and DL, because sometimes there's a lot of confusion. It's actually, first, we have computer science. Um, and within the field of computer science, we have artificial intelligence. And essentially, artificial intelligence is the engineering of intelligent machines that could kind of act like humans. And it has its roots back in 1950s. And then within artificial intelligence, so back in those days, I still remember um, there were like, like propositional logic and all that stuff. But um, nonetheless, there still needs to be some knowledge of rules that need to be encoded in these propositions. And so come machine learning in like the 1980s where is it possible just by giving the, um, the machine just examples alone so that they could, well, the machine can extract knowledge without explicitly programming such rules. And so deep learning is yet another subset of machine learning, whereby it is machine learning, but it is using neural networks as the vehicle um, for the mathematical models that we do this machine learning. 
And so it has really taken off since 1920s and, and even now, oh, sorry, 2010. Um, it's been taking off since 2010 and it's really proliferation, pr proliferating even, um, even right now. So I wanna give you guys like a perspective of like, you know, from, from a layman point of view, like, so I gave you these sets and Venn diagrams. Okay, but I wanna kind of motivate by artificial intelligence is really like, well, this whole um, progress from artificial intelligence to machine learning to deep learning is really driven by our human laziness, if you will. So artificial intelligence is essentially that um, perhaps you have a job that's super tedious and you really don't want to do it, but it's kind of, it's still not so easy that you can just, you know, um, get a robot to do. So, and it requires some troubleshooting and whatnot. So is there a way that perhaps you can, you know, write a script to do it? So artificial intelligence pretty much is motivated by the fact that you don't want to do it. You want to train a machine to do it. Now, machine learning is the motivation now, okay, granted that I don't want to do it. I want to train someone else to do it, this machine. But is it possible that, you know, not writing down these rules or these conditions that I want this task to be done, is it possible that I can just give it a whole bunch of examples whereby the examples are um, kind, of, kind of processed in a way that it highlights the important features of the problem? And so that's machine learning. Now, deep learning is like even another level of laziness where like, oh, I don't even want to do any feature engineering. It's just, oh, I don't know how to, or it's just too annoying. So is it possible for me to give tons of examples to, to the machine and for it to just learn the important features by themselves? So essentially it's a progression of laziness, but nonetheless it's productive laziness because here we are in this revolution of deep learning. Um, so there's some history, um, again, to motivate that artificial intelligence is really like, you know, from the 50s and then machine learning took off, but then deep learning is a relatively new field. And so, um, you know, one should not kind of use deep learning and AI in a synonymous sense. It's true that deep learning is the ML algorithm du jour, but it doesn't kind of supplant all of like artificial intelligence and other machine learning algorithms. So um, now that I give you kind of um, a really quick overview of the relationship between AI, ML, and DL, I'm gonna get into the workflow. And this workflow is gonna be a bit more detailed than probably one that you're used to because I wanna give you a sense of how you would actually do it if you were to kind of go home tonight super motivated to, to train an ML um, model. Okay, so generally in a problem, we have input. And these inputs might be you know, from our experiments. Um, so we have some inputs or knobs that we can, we can turn. And then when we run our experiments, generally we get some kind of target. And so that's X and Y. And so I'm, I'm gonna talk about um, machine learning workflow in a supervised learning sense, where we actually, from an input, we do get the labels or targets, which is Y. Now, in the, in the olden days, before deep learning, um, we had to do feature engineering. Um, and the reason is, for example, if you um, are taking pictures of everybody here and we want to train um, a face like recognition algorithm, we'll probably have to hand engineer some features like maybe shape of the eyes or width of the nose and all that. So that's like before deep learning. Like mm -hmm. someone actually with a lot of subject matter expert has to use that knowledge and encode it into this F function that would take your raw input, which is X, and then transform it into features of your input. So once we transformed it, then essentially now we are done with, with the feature extraction of the data. And now we are ready to um, have the D tilde, which is the set of the process inputs and target ready to go for training. Now, before we train, Generally, we have to split our data into three partitions. Um, and partitions mean essentially they are three disjoint sets. And generally, I do, um, I do a rule where it's like 80, 10, 10, meaning 80. Per so if I have um, my data, I would generally partition 80% of that into training data, 
10% to validation it and another 10 to test sets. Um, and think of it as like training data is like when you're studying for an exam, like a calculus exam. Training data is when you're reading through your notes, your, your, your book, and you're looking through the work, um, worked out examples because immediately as you see the question, the, the X, you also see the Y like in the same, kind of in the same place. So think of it as that's your worked out like examples just for your studying and that's for training of the model. Um, but validation data is kind of like the, the examples that you're supposed to try out and only you should try it out first before looking at the answer key in the back. Um, that is to test how well you actually know the knowledge from the information gleaned from the training data. And then test data clearly is like kind of the examples that you will get in an exam. Like you, you do it and that's super important because you get graded on it, but generally you may not, um, you know, it's super important for you to do well, but you may not know what your score is until, well, until later. Um, so let's move those data sets over to the side so that we can talk more about what we're gonna do with these sets of data. So I'm gonna take my training data and I'm going to train my algorithm. And generally before I do that, I need to decide what kind of algorithm or family of, um, so when I say an ML algorithm, the M, it's really just a mapping and it's not any scarier than just a mathematical mapping between inputs and parameters to a predicted output. Um, such that the predicted output, you hope that you've tuned your parameters well enough that it matches the targets that you're given. And generally, like, depending on what you know about your problem, like for example, if um, you know that your data follows a linear trend, then you, know, you will probably use a linear, um, linear regression. Um, but if it's more complicated, then you might want to use a more nonlinear model. So it's those kind of insights that um, you need to use to choose your M. And then generally, we would initialize um, the parameter. So in training, essentially, we are exposing the model to all the instances in our training set, which is here. But then all the while, we are trying to tune our parameters, which, which is theta. And that's why I've highlighted it as red. So, and generally, how do we tune this parameter? Well, we tune this parameter based on some loss function that we, um, that we pre-specify. So for example, if um, you're predicting like housing prices, so a viable loss function might be the MSE, but if for example, what you're predicting is like a class, like maybe is it a dog, is it a cat, and so on and so forth, then you might want to use something that can handle categorical um, items, which is the cross entropy loss. So there's different types of loss functions, but generally, again, based on what you know about your problem, you have to specify, specify the a priori. But nonetheless, these two are the most popular ones. So generally, because we have more than one um, training instance in our training set, we would iterate. And um, because this is a deep learning summer school, we know that generally when we train a neural network, we would use the iterative process called like stochastic gradient descent or mini bash versions of it. Um, so essentially that's the picture where um, at every iteration, imagine that you have this unknown, unknown loss function that you don't quite see slopes down, but nonetheless you're able to evaluate um, at each point given the theta. So at each iteration, you have your parameter, the theta and you have your training data. And so you apply that to estimate your targets. And then from the targets, then you can compute your loss. And so that's what these like kind of these balls represent. It's representing the loss of a specific um, instance. And because we're using gradient descent, this is the update rule that we see that we have a theta, which is the current parameter. And it's being tuned by um, some learning some um, learning rate times the gradient. And we see that when it's, um, when it's kind of like sloping down, it naturally sort of guides your um, parameters toward the optimal point, which is at the, at the bottom of this um, surface. And so um, 
ideally, if you have your alpha kind of like too big, it might kind of wiggle around, kind of bounce around. Or if it's too small, it might take forever for it to go down to find the optimum. So again, um, so even though this is intro introduction, but for those of you guys who are doing deep learning, oftentimes there are um, optimizers that do adjustable learning rates. So generally, if you guys are doing deep learning, you guys don't really have to worry about the learning rate because you can use Atom or other types of more advanced optimizers that can tune it on the fly. Um, but the idea is that given your training set, you expose the instances of your training set to your algorithm, and that's called a learning epic. And so say you um, expose the training data multiple times, like multiple passes of this training data to your algorithm, and you're tuning your theta, and it's with the hopes that, you know, you're probably pretty close to, you know, being the optimum because you've been you know, tracking your loss and it's going down, then let's say we freeze it. How do we know how good the model is? And again, the model again is just a mathematical function um, where it takes X and, and the theta, which now you're freezing to predict your Y. And so that's where the, um, oh, before I get there. So when we say how good a model is, then immediately concepts such as underfitting and overfitting are relevant. So the idea is that, so M is a function, is a mapping from input to, to the predicted um, targets. Clearly we don't want something that is like so underfitting with such like, you know, it's clearly not fitting the um, training examples. So it, this one clearly needs to go back to the training, training, I guess dojo um, to get more to get to get trained a bit more, but then here it's like it's it's trained so much that it's just memorizing all of the training examples. Such that if I were to give it a new example, like something that is not in the training instances red point, it'll just like not do well whatsoever. And so what we really want is a middle ground where there's there's a well in machine learning it's called bias variance trade off. So this is high bias and this is high variance. And we really want to kind of meet in the middle for a good fit. And so how do we, how do we know whether I'm gonna get a good fit? And so that's where our validation data set comes in. And so you, you might be thinking like, well, yeah, like finally, okay, like let's see what we do with the validation data. Um, and so the validation data is what we use to compute the loss again. So again, Recall that I froze, I, I had um, froze the parameters because I've already done a lot of training. I've exposed the algorithm to the instances of the training um, data to the point that I'm, I think I'm pretty happy with my data. So I froze it and that's what's being passed to here. So now having that model kind of frozen, the parameters frozen, then I'm gonna use it to evaluate my validation um, data. And so what I would do is, Generally, um, e even when I kind of do this back in office, it's super crucial for us to plot the losses because they um, give you a sense of what is going on in your, in your training. Um, so, but however, we know that generally um, we're doing, again, for deep learning or other methods, oftentimes if we're doing an iterative types of optimization algorithm, we kind of need to iterate this a couple of times. So previously I was iterating between um, the instances in the training data. And now I'm kind of doing this in an iterative manner. And every time I iterate, think of it as I am improving my theta. So um, each of the X here is one theta. And as I'm training, right, hopefully my theta, if my training is doing the right thing, it should it should do better. So that's why we see that at least for the training data, it's going down and it should go down because otherwise there's something wrong with your code. Um, but the validation data, you see that at some point start to go up and you might be wondering like, why is that? Well, the reason is when you train too hard. Oh, okay. So ideally the optimum is you want to stop training <clears throat> you want to stop training when the validation um, 
loss, it's at its bottom. And the reason is because generally when you split into training data, validation data, and test data, you, I mean, I mentioned that you split into 80, 10, 10 kind of um, percentage, but usually when you split these data sets, you also wanna make sure that they have the same distribution, like meaning if it's um, continuous. So, so again, using the calculus example, if you guys have been studying like derivatives, that's your training data, and it's suddenly like your practice example is still kind of derivatives with some chain rule, but then on the test, I give you like, I don't know, like, in, like integrals and stuff. Like you would, you would do, well, okay, imagine you guys didn't learn integrals yet. Like you would do super horrible in it. So it is very crucial for us to um, kind of have these three splits kind of follow some kind of distribution, maybe have the same support even. Okay, so going back, this is the optimum point because um, beyond that point, we see that validation set is going up. That tells me, going back to the study example, that means I've studied way too hard that I'm just like doing so poorly in the, in the problem set example. So I, I must stop. I must maybe, I don't know, get a coffee and just go back to my chill state of, of zero, well, as, as low as possible validation loss. However, imagine if you had stopped before the optimum point, then in a way, you're still, you still have ways to kind of improve on your validation. You see that? So that's what's called underfitting. And this picture, you guys remember this, this picture from like two slides ago or so. Um, usually when we're underfitting, it corresponds to this scenario. Again, each, of, each one of this is a theta, right? And this is a loss. And I'm showing you that if you were to use that theta to instantiate your model to do your prediction, then it might look something like this, which is not, not too good. But then if you kind of train really like for, for many epics and not really watching what's going on, then as, as mentioned, you might be kind of just overtired yourself with your, with your studying. And in the machine learning term, pretty much you are starting to memorize like all your training examples that you're not really generalizing anymore. And that's why you see this trend that um, up to a certain point generalization error, sorry, um, the validation error would go up and you really wanna stop before it does. Um, and that's the case when it's overfitting, as shown. So once we are completely happy, we have our happy optimum, um, then it's ready for test. And so the theta star is my notation for after we've gone through this process it's, and it's converged and we're fairly happy that it's really um, reached a balanced model, um, which is a good balance between bias and variance, like the nice, nice model like so, then we're going to pass these great parameters to the final model for the test, for testing our um, test, test data. And then so generally once we tested, then you know, we would, I mean, we're happy with it in terms of its performance. Then we have a model that's ready to go that could be deployed in whatever problems that you guys might have. But wah, 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 if it's really not so great, then you kind of have to go back and troubleshoot. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Machine learning types of troubleshooting could be very frustrating. Um, Sometimes like even with working with um, TensorFlow, co oh, sorry, can I, okay. Sorry, Google people in the room. Um, or any other types of deep learning library, sometimes um, they might change like the order of arguments. So I don't know, like things could be very subtle that you may not notice unless you really check the sizes of all your tensors. But I'm, I'm going too far in, into implementation. But in general, things that you can check is like, well, do you have sufficient data? Generally, if your curve, um, let me go back to this curve. Um, what you would generally wanna do is that you wanna make sure that um, your training data is close to zero as much as possible, like when it converges. And if it doesn't, that tells you that either your model doesn't have enough parameters, like expressive power to solve the problem, or that you may not have enough data. And so that's some of the like considerations there. Um, or remember, this is not 
deep learning, even though I've been kind of mixing deep learning, like talk with you guys. Um, we are using like, you know, old school features. So maybe they're the wrong features for this problem. Um, and so there could be a whole bunch of like issues that you might want to consider if your test performance isn't um, up to what you expect. So now that you guys are pretty, um, well, hopefully you guys now have a good appreciation of what it takes to train an ML algorithm. Um, I'm gonna get into deep learning and then later I'm gonna contrast how deep learning is different from traditional machine learning. Oh, well, I guess I'm doing it now, okay. Um, so traditional machine learning, as I've mentioned, has this like really tedious, aspect of feature extraction. And generally, it requires expert knowledge about the problem um, in order to extract the right features. Um, yeah, so for example, like if you are a real estate agent and you're trying to predict housing prices, um, you might, I mean, if you're a real estate agent, you know that you know the, the, whether you're in a good school district or whether you're too close to the highway, because sometimes, I don't know, you're too close to the highway, um, I don't know, like, houses tend to be cheaper than the ones that are in like the cul-de-sac. Um, okay, but yeah, but what I'm saying is that generally, if you were to kind of do this kind of traditional machine learning, you really need to understand um, the problem at hand and then use that knowledge to craft your features. And then, you can put it in you know, your favorite classification algorithm and then hopefully it will give you the desired output, which in this instance, is, it, is, it is a car. But with deep learning, it's kind of like an end-to-end -end situation. And so you see how like this poor person, um, Amazon Turk maybe is, is no longer needed because we can just dump in raw images into the neural network. And as part of its training, it's able to learn hierarchical features. <laughs> And so we don't have to do manual feature extraction anymore. We can just do this end to end. And so that's why like people really like deep learning because like, as I mentioned, like, you know, we have better things to do in life than get features or design features. So um, what is deep learning? Um, let's get back, let's get to the basics. So the basics of deep learning is we start with the artificial neuron. But actually, deep learning comes from neural networks, and neural networks um, are composed of um, these artificial neurons. And really, these neurons is not like simulating how our wonderful neurons in our brains are, but more like they're inspired by it. They're simply a mathematical model that's kind of inspired by the fact that just like the regular biological neuron, we have synapses that take signals from neighboring neurons and comes in and interact with this neuron cell body, and then out comes another output signal that is then the input to the next um, neuron down the chain. So if you look at this, like, you know, and most of you guys have probably seen this before, but nonetheless, your input is something that comes from like the previous layer or the previous neuron. And then we have these parameters, these Ws, essentially that um, you multiply with your input, and then we also add a bias term, which is the B. And then we pass this sum through a nonlinearity, F, and this is altogether what's being passed out as the output signal. And so if F is just a linear function, then all we can learn are linear, linear models. But it's because generally we choose F to be nonlinear, so that um, chaining a whole bunch of nonlinearities Nonlinear function is what really gives um, the deep, deep neural network such expressive power. So yeah, so weights and bias are the parameters. So previously I, I made a big deal about the thetas. So in, in neural networks, the Ws and the Bs are your parameters. And those are the ones that you have to tune um, by exposing your deep learning um, model to your data. So neural networks is really just neurons, but like, you know, arranged in a graph. And so, so what I showed you as one neuron, imagine now you just have a whole bunch of them and they're connected in this like kind of graphical form. And so generally um, the input um, in, 
input to your problem constitutes the input layer. And then depending on how many hidden layers you want to put in your model, and again, the more hidden layers you have, you're adding more chaining of nonlinearity, um, then that um, would increase the complexity of your model. And generally, your output layer is also dictated by the inference task at hand. So if it's a multi-class um, classification, then you might have like, you know, multiple neurons corresponding to the number of classes, or if it's just regression, then you might just have you know, one number, because that's what you're predicting. So let's dig deep and look at a little bit what the math is all about. So let's just focus on input layer. So I've been using X as my input, so that's fine. We still have the X. But then as I propagate X through this model, first layer, I, I multiplied it with the W. of So the W1 and B1 are the parameters specific to this first layer, okay? So this is like, this is just what I showed you with the um, neuron cell, like, <clears throat> but maybe I put it in kind of matrix notation, but this shouldn't come as a surprise. Hold on. <clears throat> now, as we propagate the signal from the first layer to the second layer, we see that we've added yet the magenta, like <clears throat> math to it. So the second layer, now it's transforming this output signal by multiplying with yet another weight that's specific to this second layer and adding um, this um, second layer specific bias and then putting it through the nonlinearity. So I apologize that I'm a little bit lazy here. I should say that you can choose different nonlinearities um, to, you know, specific to your layer. But here I just put F in general, but you don't have to. You can have different like nonlinearities. And now um, we're at our, our last layer, the output layer. And generally, the output layer, we kind of keep it as a, so if it's regression, then we generally just keep it as a linear um, thing without the, without the X. And so altogether, this chaining of um, mathematical transformations across layers is what constitute your model. And so that's the same model that was in the workflow earlier. And now the theta, are the things that I've highlighted in yellow. So when you're going through your machine learning workflow and trying to kind of train your model, you are actually tuning all these Ws and all these Bs. So what's the difference between just a vanilla neural network and a deep learning neural network? It really is just the fact that you have more layers, thus deep. Um, and so back in the 80s, um, pretty much they don't really have the data nor the hardware um, to really achieve the kind of massive models that we have now. And um, what's really nice about the kind of neural networks that we can train now is that because they're so massive, we can kind of peel back at the layers and examine what the model is really learning. And so imagine we have, um, you know, a picture of George Washington, whoops, pic a picture of George Washington. We see that in the, in the more, um, kind of um, the, the first layers, it's more just like rudimentary edges. And then pretty soon as you uh, move from the, the layers that are closest to the input to more like the farther out um, layers, then you see like parts of eyes or like, you know, parts of face and eventually entire face. And so um, going back to that picture where um, I was trying to differentiate between machine learning and deep learning and how Deep learning can just learn the features. This is this is how it's doing it. Essentially, for free, it's built into the graphical um, structure that we can peel away these um, these layers and be able to see what um, features are relevant. And so sometimes um, when we do deep learning, it's not just trying to train a neural network to predict something. Sometimes, as we will see later, we might want to artificially pose a problem to the neural network to trick it into learning something cool in here so that we can then take those features and do something else with it. So just kind of keep that in mind. And so you guys might think like, well, like what happened? Well, for those of you guys who are alive, I, I guess, um, like what's, what's the, like what happened between the 80s and now? Um, well, it's really like the confluence of three things. Um, so 
like long time ago um, in the beginning. So in like, yeah, the 50s. So essentially they can only train really small models because first they're hardware limited. They're also really data limited. And then in the 80s, um, they're able to kind of figure out, you know, more tricks in order to kind of develop the early neural networks. But then, you know, poor people, poor researchers, they, they're still stuck with really limited hardware. But at least, hey, they got MS. Um, but now we're like, we have, we have ImageNet, we have um, Recipe 1M, like we have so much data. And for those of you guys, you know, who, you know, take pictures and post them and like are super active on social. You guys are every day contributing data. Um, so <laughs> essentially the data, I mean, we have, we have a really good handle on data now. Um, and also with the investments of like Nvidia and other, other hardware companies really investing into the hardware, the infrastructure, um, that's really a, like, like the confluence of everything, including super smart researchers that are figuring out new ways to um, train, train things deeper, better with residual layers and things like that. It's the confluence of the smarts, the hardware and the data that's really kind of let, letting us overcome this like sad, sad AI winters to like explosive growth right now. And, you know, explosive growth, I, I can't leave this without kind of just pitching again now. Deep learning is truly everywhere. Um, it's in image classification, as you could tell. Um, so yeah, like when you upload your pictures to any kind of cloud um, service, oftentimes they immediately categorize your, your moments, your photos, your faces. So it's all deep learning. Um, and it's also starting to play a really big part in medicine and bi um, biology as well. Um, so such as like um, when people have diabetes, they often have, they often could go blind because of some kind of diabetic retinox. I'm not pronouncing this right, but um, we are also involved in some healthcare projects where we're trying to help um, build deep learning models to help them um, diagnose multimodal, sorry, diagnose um, illnesses based on multimodal data, such as radiology reports, as well as like images. Um, and yeah, so on and so forth, essentially, you are pretty much touched by deep learning like everywhere. Like if you have a phone, it's, it's, it's touching you right now. Um, yeah. So that brings us to um, a really quick intro of deep learning. Now I'm gonna get into the three main branches of machine learning. And again, I promise to like not bog to spend too much time on the, on the super classical methods. Um, the reason is, if we were to do this kind of, um, you know, this lecture like right, we need a lot more time to kind of go over all the classical methods. And so I'm, I'm going to kind of um, mention them briefly, but then kind of quickly sh tell you that within the deep learning perspective, how are we achieving each one of these um, different types of learning? So machine learning actually has three branches. And we see here there's supervised learning, which um, if you recall the machine learning, like, you know, the workflow, that's pretty much like supervised learning workflow right there, where we're assuming that we have some kind of target so that our data is considered with labels. And depending on whether we are um, predicting something that's categorical, that's classification, or we are predicting like a real value number, that's regression. Now, on supervised learning here, it's kind of like, things like clustering and dimension reduction, where you really don't get the targets, you don't get the Ys, you only get the X. And maybe some, sometimes um, it's just too expensive to get the Ys, um, so that like you just wanna see what you can do with the X. Um, and in general, in supervised learning, the goal really is to uncover kind of structure in this unlabeled data. And so naturally, like things like clustering and dimension reduction seems to, um, be the kind of approaches one would take for unsupervised learning. Now, reinforcement learning um, has been getting a lot of um, attention um, because AlphaGo and like all, all the all the cool things that um, and even like autonomous like cars. So, in a nutshell, it is learning actions um, 
based on feedback from the environment. Essentially, it, um, it's in the realm of sequential decision making. And it's like all together, all these three fields kind of come together and um, constitute our everyday machine learning, even though most of the time, you know, we're, we're kind of focused on supervised learning, but all the other areas sort of all play, um, all play well in everyday life. And, and I was gonna say that like, even though these branches are like branches, like there's technical names to it. I wanna say that even in our everyday life, like these kind of types of learning are not too far removed from like the way we do things. So for example, like imagine you are learning how to drive. Like you don't know how to drive yet, but you're learning how to drive. And so you're taking your driving school or like maybe your, your parents, you know, your parents like watching you and teaching you. So immediately that's supervised learning because if you like make a turn too close to the curb, someone's gonna like, like, I don't know, step on a brake or, or do something. So very supervised learning. But then say once you're comfortable enough to like drive on your own. And so as you're, as you're driving, um, of course, you are taking actions, you are reacting to the environment. Imagine you have to, you have to make a left turn, one of those left turns that has no light signal, you just gotta be like aggressive. Um, so say the first time when you have to get to work, you, you never got to work on time because you were there for like 15 minutes, but then next day you're gonna be better and so on and so forth. So learning from experience, that's reinforcement learning. And unsupervised learning is sometimes, say if you're like driving in, like a different city. So recently I, I went to Rome and like those people, they just drive, they, they don't stop. So in a way like you, you can partition, you know, people's internal like driving behavior so that you can react accordingly. So, you know, pretty much all these three branches, even though they're in machine learning, but they're really like, you know, there's analogs of it in our everyday life. So they're not that foreign. Um, so, Let's talk a bit deeper about how they're different. So as, as we know, supervised learning, we have our target, that's the label, right? And generally, once we train our neural network or machine learning uh, model, we would then compare against the, sorry, so this is, this is what um, we are predicting, and then we're comparing it against the ground truth. And generally, you know, if it's, Continuous, remember we use some kind of like root mean square and if it's categorical, we use um, some kind of cross <clears throat> entropy. Um, and so that's a loss that is then used as a signal to tell us how well are we doing? How good is my M? And whether, and the M, because it depends on the theta, whether I still need to tune my theta. So that's supervised learning. And we know immediately that it's immediate feedback because if you're not doing well immediately, you know you're not doing well. You can use that loss signal to kind of um, tune your parameters. But reinforcement, on the other hand, is a little bit different. It's kind of like, well, you have what's called like delayed um, rewards. Because sometimes, like, say you are playing a video game um, and you are, I don't know, moving a joystick or if it's Xbox, you do those things like that. <laughs> and you may not know that, oh, like you should have done something else until you die. Um, and you might die maybe five minutes later because you used up your ammo or something. Um, so in a way that the reward is not immediate, sorry, the signal is not immediate, but the reward kind of comes generally in a delayed sense. And the output is not something that you, someone can tell you that's the right action to take. It's more like you take the action, it um, influence the state of the world, and that in itself would then give you this reward which you can use as your signal to how well you're doing. Now, unsupervised learning is like, you get no feedback. It's more like you're clustering. Um, so you just predict, but you may not like know exactly how well you did. Um, I mean, in a math sense, but of course, like when we predict something, of course, like we have certain hypotheses um, and other kind of um, outside knowledge that comes with doing machine learning. So generally we would leverage those to see like, oh, like do the clusters make sense and so on and so forth. But in general, like these three kind of run the spectrum from 
um, supervised learning, reinforcement learning to un unsupervised learning in this spectrum of feedback to no feedback. So now let's dig deep into like each one of them. So supervised um, learning mainly are then split into two other um, categories, classification and regression. Classification is when you are trying to predict something that is like a class or something categorical. Regression is when you're trying to predict something that is a, a real a real number, like um, you know how tall how tall I should have been if I had slept when I was younger, or um, I don't know, like how like what's the average age someone would live to if they was diagnosed with this like illness, like so on and so forth. Um, so these are the classical methods. Um, so as you can see here. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to like talk really quickly about like just select few. So in the classification family, right, um, generally naive base is that you literally, you have your data and then you kind of do your counting in order to kind of get these probabilities and then you apply base rules. And then that's how you um, build your naive base spam detector. Um, again, it's super simple. And because of that, um, spammers have now gotten really smart about like adding specific words that are like, um, that would kind of um, bias the algorithm. So people generally don't use naive base spam filters anymore. Um, now, um, decision tree here, um, again, decision tree is pre-deep learning. And essentially you, you give it data and it's able to partition um, the data into very interpretable types of branches so that so that the roots of these are what gives the prediction. Um, so decision tree has the you know great feature, sorry, great quality that it's very interpretable. Now SVM was pretty hot um, back when I was I guess in grad school. Um, essentially you have your data and you know that um, the goal is essentially to separate these classes with hyperplane that maximally separates them. And generally, you might kind of put your data, transform it into a higher dimension so that this is possible. But nonetheless, like these three, I mean, there are others, but um, these are the kind of um, classical algorithms from the classification subbranch. Now, as for regression, regression is kind of, um, it's, it's got its roots in statistics, right? Um, and essentially linear and polynomial regression, it's pretty much like what you see, what you see here. Um, yeah, so I just covered the classical methods, but now let's talk about with deep learning. So with deep learning, how do we do regression and classification? Well, sorry, I got tired. I didn't do the cool animations anymore. So um, bear with me. Um, the idea is that you still have a network, right? And if you're doing classification where it's just like true or false, right? Then, yeah, if it's only true or false, then essentially you want to predict the probability. The number you're predicting is the probability that like class one is true. And then the other class would be like one minus that probability. So that's why you only have one output neuron and it's predicting within a range zero to one. And so that's why for the output um, nonlinearity, generally we would choose something like the sigmoid function because it squishes the signal to be between zero and one. Um, yeah, so this is how you would do it for classification if it's just true or false. Um, and once you get your prediction, then you will compare against whether it's actually true or false. And by using this cross entropy loss to help tune your parameters. But what I'm, um, but say like if we have a very related problem, but now we have multiple labels. So previously it could be like, um, am I female or male? Um, and then next will be like, am I over 40 years old? Um, so, you know, I could, I could be true on multiple um, categories. And so that, that's why instead of just one number, now we are predicting several numbers and uh, several numbers correspond to the number of classes in which I can participate in. Um, 
So, and that corresponds to the number of upper neurons as well. So you can see, we pretty much, we could keep the same, like if the input is practically the same, all these layers could pretty much be fixed. And all you're doing is essentially, well, first of all, you need to make sure your target um, is now multitask, and then you make adjustments to the output layers um, and adjust your loss if necessary, but here we can still use the cross entropy loss. But for example, if we want to do regression, regression, again, I am predicting just one number and it's a real value number. So it's between negative um, infinity to infinity. Then you see how I changed my nonlinearity from sigmoid to linear because I don't want to squish my output to you know, zero and one anymore because I wanted to go free to, to be between negative um, infinity and infinity. And also I would then modify my loss function to be, you know, the um, mean square error as shown. So what I'm saying is with supervised learning, deep learning is actually pretty easy peasy because um, as long as your input um, stays the same, if you want to do regression or classification, you can actually do it. And in fact, um, the computer vision people um, say if they want to, say if they have this picture and they want to know what is it and can you draw a bounding box like around it, <clears throat> around it, they're able to use this neural network, which is really small, but trust me, is a, is a neural network um, with some other layers. But then you see how they're able to split it into two parts. One that is doing the classification, right? It's predicting the probability that it belongs to the class cat, dog, and so on and so forth. And then this regression part, where it's, regress it's regressing um, you know, the, the starting point of the bounding box, x, y, and then how big the box is. And then together, they have ways to kind of combine both loss together to actually solve this problem, whereby they can now, given this picture, they will be able to output the category as well as the bounding box. So to my knowledge, I don't think the classical methods can do that. So that's like a really, that's a big win um, for, for us who have access to deep learning. Um, so deep learning, again, um, for supervised learning, it's pretty straightforward. And for unsupervised learning, um, that's the second branch where you don't have the um, labels. And so you don't really get any kind of feedback as to how well you do. Um, and so generally we do things like clustering, dimension reduction, or some kind of association. And so, um, yeah, let's, let's dig deep a little bit and just go over quickly some of the classic methods. So here, this is like k-means here. So k-means essentially that you have some data, right? And you also have to specify number of clusters and you randomly initialize your clusters to be some point. Um, and then what you do is then, is then you um, assign the neighboring points to the cluster as shown, right? And then based on this, say this is your cluster, then you recompute your centroid to the cluster. And then you do it again and again until it kind of um, partitions the data in this kind of nice neighborhood. And DB scan, so these are our clusters. DB scan is another one of these clustering algorithms where is imagine um, you have data points and they're people and you're telling them, hold hands if you're close to your neighbor. And so that's really what they do. They um, associate the neighbor that is of, um, like close enough to be in the same cluster and any and any points that don't have their hands held is a weirdo because it's flagged as an alpha. Um, and for dimension reduction, I mean, generally like we, we, um, we do, we kind of use statistical methods like SVD and all these kind of um, like latent semantic analyses to kind of get at this unstructured data into something that's more structured. Um, so yeah, so the classical methods, so these are some of the classical methods. Now, let's talk deep learning. Um, so deep learning, I feel like it's, it's actually pretty exciting in terms of like unsupervised learning because people 
doing unsupervised learning within deep learning, um, it's actually quite clever. They've been kind of leveraging a lot of what's called self um, supervised learning. And so imagine that we want to we want to compress data. And we have a picture like this. But remember, I told you that sometimes we trick our neural network into doing something dumb so that we can get something cool on the inside. So this is exactly one of those times. I'm telling it, hey, this is my input, reconstruct this input. Like that's just like weird, right? But by um, having the layers kind of um, progressively smaller, like a show, so, so I've drawn it like a bow tie thing, not because like it's pretty, it actually is the size of the layers as, as we um, kind of get to this latent feature, which is what I want to force the network to um, kind of compress this data into. Um, and the decoder is essentially like the, um, the inverse. So, um, so encoder again, compresses the input into this latent feature. So the lower dimensional representation of my, of my data. And I call that like, you know, so if this feature, if this um, vector is called H, right? Um, then it's F is my encoder. Decoder is like taking H, right? Then I want to get back at my original input. And so an auto encoder is all these together, um, chaining it up where I want X and R to be really close together. And if um, this is trained properly, you get a really nice compressed feature that represents um, your input without all the dimension dimension of your um, your, of your input. Um, yeah. So another thing you guys might have heard of is word to vec. Um, so back in the days before word to vec, um, people doing natural language processing would like take a document, and then what they do is that they will save as apple, orange, or car. They'll literally just like make it into a vector where everything is zero except one, where one is the is where it is in the dictionary. Some not not like a web dictionary, but like your your computer program dictionary. But the thing is like imagine like if like apple and orange, like alphabetically they're kind of far, but semantically they're food, they're fruits, and maybe they got that reddish orange hue, you know. So so like ideally if you were to think about it, you want them kind of close in similarity when you represent them in a numeric sense. And so that's what word to vec is about. It's saying that, hey, given this, right, this, we call these one hot vectors. One hot vectors means they're all zeros except for just one one. Can we transform these one hot vectors into these other vectors where it's more dense, where it's not just all zeros, but it's got like non, um, like non zeros in, in more, more entries. Um, and so for example, here, if we were to do it right, ideally we want apple and orange to kind of like look more similar than car. And the, the blue and the red um, denotes like values that are kind of close together. Um, so you might think that, oh, well, that's interesting, but um, how do you do that? It actually is very much is very similar to the autoencoder. So instead of um, reconstructing the actual words, because like I want I want this, you know, um, what we do instead is that we predict the neighboring words. So it's kind of like given a word, I'm gonna predict my neighbors, um, and so I'm gonna make this more concrete for you. So for example, if you have these sentences here, like I like playing, blah blah blah. So what you do is that you actually um, have a center word that's kind of like, um, you know, what, so there are actually two flavors of this algorithm. So you can have your center word and then the window of words like before, before and after you, they're what you call the context words. So you see how like, as you slide your center word kind of down, you get more kind of context word, like your window kind of shifts. and I like playing is I is now the center word, like playing are like these two words and so on and so forth. So again, even though deep learning, I said, oh, you don't need to do like feature engineering. 
with text, you you need to at least do some of these kind of um, like one hot transform transformation before you can do things with them. So say you have encoded your text in this kind of data, data format, then depending on whether given center word, you want to predict context words, or given context words, you want to predict center words, that gives you like two flavors of um, models that allows you to learn the these dense vectors, which we call word index. So again, like the autoencoder, um, the autoencoder, I kind of drew a lot of layers, but word to vec is actually a very shallow um, model where it's just the one hot vectors and then the hidden layer. And that's, that's essentially the word, the word um, vectors are the ones that are what we're interested in, they're like right here. And so it's just like, you know, is a really shallow network. Um, so again, it's either you're predicting center words to context words or context words to center words. So I don't want to like go in too deep, but I want you guys to recognize that this has really revolutionized like NLP in general, um, the way that we're able to now represent words in a semantically relevant way. Um, has really paved the way for a lot of the more advanced um, natural language processing tasks, like captioning and, and all that. So another really cool idea in unsupervised learning. So GANs is, is kind of like um, interesting in that um, it was originally proposed as an unsupervised method, but it's been now used for like semi-supervised and not. But um, nonetheless, with GANs, you don't really need to have the labels because all you really need is the is the input. And again, it's essentially, it's a generative model. So previously we talked about classification where it's class one and class two. So all those other um, models are more like discriminative models where from inputs you are, you are just modeling what the prediction ought to be. But here we're trying to model, given an input, what is the probability like around that input? So such that we can perhaps use a probability distribution to generate more input. And so the way it works is that there's actually two parts to it, the generator and the discriminator. And so the, okay, the discriminator is just like what we kind of went over where given an image is trying to now do a binary classification problem. Is it real? Is it a real picture from the training set or is it a fake picture that the um, generator is, is trying to create to kind of fake me out. And now the generator is trying to take some kind of like, you know, random noise and use it as seed to create something that is synthetic, a synthetic image, but hopefully has the same kind of distribution as the training set so that it can fool the discriminator. And so it's this like two player game that it's got going so discriminator, again, is the, um, the neural network that takes the picture and it doesn't know whether it's from the, the, um, the fake one or the true training set. And it's trying to essentially maximize the probability of um, being able to distinguish between the two of them. But then the generator is trying to um, learn about the distribution of the um, true training data set so that it can, it can it can essentially fool the discriminator into thinking that its images are, are actually true. So it's this two player game. And even though it's a really cool idea, um, it's sometimes it's hard to train, um, but nonetheless, um, if you are brave enough to kind of check it out, people have used GANs for data augmentation. And so what I'm showing you here is from this paper called Deep Fluids where they um, gave it a whole bunch of like fluid simulation, 2D, 3D, as well as some um, simulation inputs. And they're able to, so this is one of those plots that I've showed you where it's like, these, this is the epic and this is the loss. And at each time step, I'm also showing you like what the actual, you know, the GAN um, fake picture looks like. And you see how in the beginning it's like not doing so well. So, Maybe it's like kind of underfitting, but as it as it continues, it it looks it looks like real fluid simulation. So um, yeah, so 
I've covered autoencoders, word vec and GANs. Um, those three are examples of unsupervised learning within deep learning. Um, I think I'm probably going to skip over the learning part. So with reinforcement learning, um, it's very exciting because um, I guess perhaps I I want to say like maybe like by the time I retire, maybe I don't have to drive anymore and I just like tell my car to take me to LA and it can just do it. Um, we'll see. Um, but yeah, reinforcement learning has been pretty big because um, well, all the all the um, like the I guess the Ubers and all the autonomous car companies, as well as um, there's just a lot of like automation that is out there um, in terms of these industries also putting investment into reinforcement learning. But like, okay, what is reinforcement learning? So as I've mentioned, reinforcement learning, imagine you're an agent, so you're this brain, you have, oops, you have a brain, and um, you get some observation from the environment. Um, and from this observation, you kind of internalize and think like, okay, like the state of the world is probably this. And then you take the action and that action changes the state of the world, which um, in turn then generates a reward, which you receive and another observation, which you get again. And that seeds your next um, set of action. And this process kind of iterates. And again, like it's like way mathier than it has to be. Again, it's very like intuitive. It's kind of like, it is like any one of you guys who play video games um, or, you know, even like try to bake muffins, like anything. So essentially as you're doing something new, you try different things and then based on the outcome of whether you've succeeded or not, then you kind of modify your actions based on what you've observed as, you know, of um, having done right or wrong, as well as the reward. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, the agent, so the reward is a time delay feedback, and the agent's job is really to take actions that maximize the cumulative reward. Meaning, like, if this is a game, you want to maximize not just your next time set reward, but like your rewards across all the, all the time that you're playing this game. So let's formulate this a little bit more. Um, so a markup decision process is a nice way of kind of, kind of um, describing this kind of decision process. And so with a MDP, markup decision process, we have our observation space, our action space, and um, a way to kind of encode how do states and action make can, can help um, the agent transition to, I'm oh, sorry, the world transition to the next state. So that's a state transition function. And also your reward, because that's the signal that you will get. It's a kind of discount factor because, um, because if you're playing this kind of like over infinite horizon, you want to make um, kind of, you want to discount it so that it's like temporally like relevant. And so we also, an MDP, Markov satisfy clearly the Markov property such that the, the states at the next time step only depends on the states of your current time step and, and your action. So with this, essentially, when you formulate an RL problem, um, you pretty much have to know your observation space, action space, and, and all these um, formulation. And some extra concepts. So in general, the agent is trying to um, maximize the reward. And this reward that's shown is this kind of like weighted, well, it's this weighted sum, this discounted sum um, of the reward that it would get at each round. So this is what the agent wants to maximize. And a policy is describes how an agent should behave. So it's a mapping between, um, sorry, from state to the action. And the value function is essentially a way of saying like, hey, if I'm in this specific state, what is my expected reward? Like how good is, how good am I? Like, am I sitting pretty in this state? Um, and yeah, so these are the V and Q values that kind of represent how good it is to be in a certain state. Now, how do you go about learning optimal policy? Because ultimately we want to maximize this. And we know that our rewards is due to us taking a good action and you know, being in the right state and everything. So therefore, 
we need to learn a good mapping from state to action. So a good policy. And so imagine if we know how good it is to be in a specific state, sorry, um, that for every action, we know how, how good that um, the expected rewards would be, then we will be able to just do an arg map. But this Q function is tricky. Like how do we, how do we exactly know? Um, we kind of have to play the game and kind of observe what rewards we get in order to find out, right? And so what we could do is we could actually frame it as um, another one of these like regression problems where at a given time, you're trying to um, model what your Q is. So you have a model that is trying to predict Q. And at any given time, that is your current estimate. But then once you take the action and you get your rewards, then this is what you actually actually got. Um, and so you can use that um, difference as your feedback in order to kind of learn this function. And so traditionally, what's been done is that essentially every time you have um, a state action combination, you log it and you know that's why it's called tabular, right? But with deep learning, Again, we are able to learn functions that could map states to the Q value. And so that's what we do. Um, and by applying this, um, I mean, essentially this paper um, in 2013 where um, they applied the deep learning towards the Q learn, sorry, deep, learn, deep neural networks for Q learning um, on Atari games, essentially they use um, like several frames and then they put it through, again, one of these neural networks, the convolutional layers that I'm sure Mustafa is going to cover later on. And then out they just compute the, um, the Q values that's specific for like, you know, like as shown. So as a result, it's kind of like anywhere reinforcement learning has places where it's approximating a function, deep learning has kind of find, found its way to kind of like fulfill that need and do it really well. Um, and yeah, pretty much um, that's, that's what I have for reinforcement learning. But I also want to call the attention that the other types of learning, such as the transfer learning, semi-supervised learning, active learning. So transfer learning is kind of like, once you have a model that you've trained, you now have a related problem. You don't want to throw away all, the, all your hard work of tuning all the parameters. It's kind of like, is there a way you can transfer that knowledge over? So that's transfer learning. And semi-supervised, it's kind of like a mishmash between supervised and unsupervised. Imagine for supervised learning, you have, you can only afford to have a really small training data that has labels, but then you have a whole bunch of other um, data that is not labeled. So that's unsupervised. Is there a way to perhaps learn structure from the unsupervised and then use that to kind of um, provide good initial values for your supervised problem. So there's like different ways of doing that kind of like mishmash of supervised and unsupervised. And lastly, active learning is when, um, again, you are, you don't have much um, training data. You only have like a few instances. Is there a way that um, if you can have a model that not only predicts the, the prediction, but also tells you how uncertain it is for you to then compute some kind of entropy so that you would then use that information to know at a given time where your model is uncertain so that you can then selectively say, okay, now I wanna choose that point where I know my model does not do well in and get a label for it. So that's kind of active learning. And um, even though today I didn't talk about um, deep learning, being able to do like uncertainty um, characterization. There are Bayesian versions of um, neural networks that um, people have used for active learning. So this is my last slide. Like in summary, that is the, the Venn diagram um, where AI is, is the biggest um, field and then inside it ML and then inside ML is DL um, and DL are great because it learns hierarchical features, which are super useful. Um, and really their growth is fueled by the fact that we have tons of data and hardware advances, as well as really smart people figuring out like the 
practical aspects of training things well so that they could get the kind of amazing results that get us all excited. Um, and the three branches of ML, the main branches are supervised learning, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. And for all three of them, um, deep learning really, you know, is, is, is really a team player with all three of them. With supervised learning, we've already seen it. It's super easy to kind of go between regression and classification. You can even do it together. Remember the cat and the bounding box, which is super cool. Um, and with unsupervised learning, um, we saw that people use clever ways of creating a fake signal. So remember the autoencoder, the signal, the target is itself, or the word to vest, the signal was nearby words. So there's really no true labeling involved, but it's using um, kind of like an artificial yet meaningful question within the structure itself to, to do the unsupervised learning of the, the structure. And reinforcement learning, well, it's been, I've only talked about, you know, how um, the DQN, which is using reinforcement learning to approximate the Q function, but um, there's other works where reinforcement, sorry, deep learning can also be used to learn the policy mappings directly, as well as to approximate the, um, the models that go into the, the Markov decision process. And once you have those models, then essentially, if you have a good approximation of them, you can, it boils down to a planning problem, which um, is easier to solve. Well, in most cases. Um, yeah, but that's pretty much it. And if you guys have questions, just feel free to, um, to speak up. Thank you.